Hi there. Uh, thanks for the festival, uh, for inviting our film. And you get me with it. This is kind of a package deal, um, whether you like it or not. Uh, it's great to be back in Vancouver. I love it here. I've shot here quite a bit. Um, well, the, uh, this is a pretty theater. Sorry, I'm just getting my bearings. Um, the, uh, for about the last 10 years, I, I've been making quite a few docs over the last dozen years, and uh, several of them, in, including my very first documentary, have been about uh, the growth of online communities and what the implications of, of these communities are for uh, the people on them and for the planet and for the companies behind them um, in some cases. And, um, you know, I'm an older fella, uh, so I came up in the analog era, but uh, I got very involved in the rise of the net pre-web in the 80s and uh, quite active in the online communities that existed at that time, which were, for those of you uh, who were of a similar vintage, uh, dial-up modem, uh, there was no web, it was uh, mostly text-based, what we called the Usenet or BBS era. Uh, it was largely communicating via text, but it was extraordinary. And uh, it was very liberating. Uh, it wasn't all peaches and cream. It was when you open floodgates, all kinds of stuff comes through. But uh, it was legitimate community. And uh, there was a lot of political activism going on in that space. In fact, a, lot, a large part of the work I've done uh, with my documentaries has been with the connections I have on the more political activist end of the internet, going back to the cypherpunks and folks that came up actually in the 50s and 60s and really took off in the 70s um, and sort of built the foundation of the net that then became the foundation of the web that then became things like crypto and things that we're dealing with today. Uh, a lot of that stuff got written about and then sort of initiated uh, years ago by largely very politically active people who were very concerned about surveillance uh, in the 60s. <laughs> so they had a bit of a jump on Snowden. Um, so my first talk uh, in this space was about Napster. And uh, Napster, on the outside, appeared to be and was sort of purported to be by the media mostly a music stealing service uh, that allowed punks to use the internet to circumvent the record industry. Um, for me and for a lot of other people, that wasn't what Napster was at all. Napster was the first large scale online community of real time users, which was, it's kind of hard to, uh, to kind of oversell how significant a watershed moment that is in terms of human uh, congregation. Uh, it was the first time you had 100 million people online at once talking to each other. Uh, I made a lot of friends on Napster all over the world, and, and I had a lot of music already, and I didn't need a lot more, so I wasn't using it to kite music primarily. Um, it doesn't mean there weren't huge problems with Napster on, an, on a legal, ethical level. That's part of what's interesting to me about technology is it's not black and white at all, uh, but it tends to get painted that way. So. I'm not going to give you a course history on all my docs. I'm going to get us up to, you, to the one we're watching tonight. Uh, but I've often sort of ridden within the fuzzy edges of the internet in terms of legality, morality, ethics, activism, where activism meets black hat hacking, where is the line between criminality and activism. These things are very interesting to me because it's, it's a, a, it has a lot to do with the world that we're in today. And I believe it has a lot to do with how we will move forward from here now that we live in essentially a tech oligarchy that's run by two or three very large companies uh, who are very good at surveillance and data mining and profit making and not terribly concerned about, uh, about ethics or, or the human beings on the other end of the pipeline. Uh, at YouTube, you know, if you don't know, is really the front end of Google. It's Google's media front end, essentially. And it's not, you know, like a lot of these things, it's done an enormous amount of good. Probably more good than many people realize in terms of, uh, we get into some of it in the film. Uh, they are essentially our library Alexandria. I mean, they're, they're 
the way most people get their information. They're not just a social media platform. They're not just about how to fix your, your bike tire or you know, how to see cute pictures of cats, though I do enjoy it for that. Um, it is really Google's front end, uh, and it is the largest media platform on the planet by an order of magnitude. Much bigger than the TV industry, much bigger than the movie industry, much bigger than Netflix, much bigger than Twitter or Facebook. In terms of how you process information, there are more people who are plugged into this media front end than anything else on Earth. Uh, that's significant. What does that mean? What's good about that? What's bad about that? What is the company doing? Um, and I don't want to yak too much because I made a movie about it and you're about to watch 90 minutes of it. But uh, just to contextualize it, the reason that I, that I wanted to do this story about this film is because I like telling stories that involve questions I don't know the answer to. Um, if I knew the answer, I would just write an article and stick it on the internet and solve all the world's problems. That would be, that would be the end of it. But I, they're thorny. Um, there are real issues at play here that are very thorny. And, and as a dad, I've got three boys, all of whom have come up in the digital age, uh, none of whom have gotten black-pilled, thankfully. Uh, but you know, as a, as a parent and as a sort of citizen of the now digital world, uh, and as someone who is, I would say, you know, I'm well-versed, I wouldn't call myself an expert, but I'm pretty well-versed in this mm -hmm. landscape. You know, the question I think that everyone has on their mind, including me, is like, what do we do? Like, what do we do? Uh, the answers we get are so unsatisfying to me, even from other documentaries. You know, well, just get off these platforms. Well, that's not going to happen. Turn off your computer and go outside. It's like, well, that's not going to happen. I mean, we live online today. The digital world is going to play a bigger and bigger part of our lives. It's not going to play a smaller part. And going offline does not help you uh, if these platforms are instigating violence that's being enacted on people, and largely on marginalized communities. I mean, you can do that, but it's a kind of selfish thing to do. Um, so what do we do, right? How do we deal with the world that we're in that is not all bad, um, but where we're not seeing immediate solutions that are uh, quantifiable, practical, and frankly, doable? Um, you know, I don't know if I'm doing a Q&A, so I don't know if we'll be able to talk about this after, so am I? Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. Um, there, are, I, there are ways of, of dealing with this stuff, but I, I largely believe that it starts with acceptance. Uh, and that's not a lot of what I see. I see a lot of either it's all terrible or this evangelical get an NFT and make $100 million with your crypto Lamborghini or whatever, right? You've got these crazy pendulum swings uh, and very little uh, practical, actionable conversation going on in the middle lane where things actually get done. Uh, and I think that's, in a sense, to the degree we have a thesis, we're really just trying to tell a good story with interesting people at the end of the day. But that's probably what it is, is how do you cut through all of this crap and come out the other end with some acceptance of the world we actually are in, whether we like it or not, and the implications and significance of that, and then what, as average citizens, can we do about it? So that's um, the YouTube effect. Thank you. <laughs>